Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14 in your Bibles. Begin reading with verse number 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Faith never retreats. Faith never remains static. True faith has only one direction, and that's forward. Pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. When a minister today on the subject, go forward. Go forward. Would you bow your heads? Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the weekend that we've had here at Happy Gospel in Bradenton, Florida. We're grateful and thankful for all of these that have come out this morning. We ask for your anointing to deliver the word and the anointing to rest upon them to hear and to understand as well. Help me to encourage, inspire. Help me to illuminate the truth of God's word. And Lord, we give you all the praise and glory. And everybody said, amen and amen. Faith sees beyond mountains. Faith always sees beyond giants. Faith never sees sickness. It sees healing. Faith never sees Poverty, it sees prosperity. Faith never sees brokenness, but it sees reconciliation and restoration. Now, that doesn't mean that faith denies there's a problem. True faith always acknowledges the reality. But true faith sees beyond what is in the natural. Now, do you understand what I'm saying this morning? True faith will acknowledge, yes, you may be sick. But true faith says, my God is the healer. With his stripes, we are healed. Yes, true faith will acknowledge the reality that we may be facing financial problems. But true faith sees ahead and says, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Yes, faith will always acknowledge when your back is against the wall and the giant comes against you. But true faith will always see, I, I've killed a lion and I've killed a bear. So giant, you're no match for me. True faith will pick up that stone and true faith will say, you come against me with a sword, a shield, and a spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And today, today they will know that there is a God in Israel. Hallelujah. The Bible says of Enoch that Enoch had a testimony that pleased God. What was that testimony that pleased God? If you're like me, I want to know what pleases the Lord. Some of y'all are still awake. I mean, still asleep. I may have to run around the building a little bit and get you keyed up. What pleases God? What is the testimony that pleases the Lord? Well, the next verse in Hebrews tells us. It said, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. God is looking for a people today that believe the Lord. God is looking for a people today that won't take no for an answer. God is looking for a people today that will say it's not by might, it's not by power, but it is by the Spirit of the Lord. 
The Lord is looking for men and women that will stand up and say, Today, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. The Lord is looking for men and women that will stand up and say, I am weak within my own strength, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You've got to understand something today. There is a fight going on. There is a war going on. The Bible tells us that Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's all that the devil wants you to see is the battle. But there's a second part to St. John 10.10. 10. The Lord said, but, but I am come that you might have life and life more abundantly. The Lord wants you to believe Him. The Lord wants you to stand upon His Word. The only currency that spins in heaven is faith. Do you believe God? Do you believe what this book says? Do you believe that the Lord is able to do great and mighty things? Do you believe in Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe the same Lord that spoke the world into existence, that put the stars in the heaven, and the Scripture says He has named every single one of them? Do you believe the same one who took dirt and clay and formed the image of a man and breathed life into him and man became a human living being, a living soul. If you believe that, then you've got to believe the same one that is the God of creation is the same one that can open your Red Sea. He's the same one that walks with you in the fire. He's the same one that can put food on your table and clothes on your back and gas in your automobile. He's the one that can keep your children. He's the one that can bring healing. He's the one that can bring deliverance. He's the one that's greater and more powerful than every attack of the evil one. He is the one that he said, kill this body. But on the third day, I'm coming out of the tomb. And on that third day, that resurrection morn, Jesus Christ stepped out of the tomb victorious over death, hell, and the grave. That's the God that we serve. Do you believe that? I, I, I get always amused when I hear some Christians say, well, I've never seen a miracle. That's the biggest bunch of malarkey. There's probably some of you here this morning, I never seen a miracle. Yes, you have. Matter of fact, Every time you look in the mirror, you're looking back at a miracle. You were once lost. You were once unsaved. You were once on your way to hell. But somehow the light of the glorious gospel penetrated the darkness of your soul, reached down, snatched you up out of the fire, set your feet on a rock to stand, wrote your name down in the Lamb's book of life, calls you son and calls you daughter. You were once an alien, as the scripture says, to the commonwealth of Israel. But now, you have been grafted into the kingdom you are a child of the living God you are a living breathing miracle Woo! the devil will tell you you're nobody tell him I'm a miracle you're nobody I'm a miracle you're nobody I'm a miracle you're nobody I'm a miracle of the grace of of God. And it's a shame that we're living in a day and time we have too many Christians that let the circumstances of life and the circumstances of the world impact our thought process more than the word of Almighty God. preaching in Texas right after the election that was stolen. (laughs) 
How far should I go? No further. You know, the Bible talks about that old evil, wicked woman, Jezebel. I, got, I want you to know, Jezebel is not dead. Her name is Nancy Pelosi. Man, if I had to wake up to that woman every morning, I'd be saved so many times over. Can we edit that out of the feed? Because I'm sure I got some Democrats watching. Now we're, la but you know what? I want to say something about this. I'm going to say it for the those that are streaming in. This is not funny. This is serious. Don't you dare stand up and say, I'm a born-again, spirit-filled believer and walk into your voting precinct and vote for baby killers and supporters of same-sex marriage and transgenderism I'll even take it further. You are of your father, the devil. Now you know why people don't like me. So. But as I said, faith never retreats or remains static. When our boys landed on Omaha Beachhead in June the 6th, 1944, to begin to push into Nazi Germany to eradicate, to defeat Adolf Hitler, the advancement of our armed forces, Americans, British, Canadian, it was unparalleled as we began to push into occupied Europe. We had made such advances until actually our troops were surging so far ahead of reinforcement and supplies that they were finding themselves strung out and unable to keep up with the demand of bullets, of water, of food. They had pushed into Belgium. And then finally it was in December 1944. The weather turned against the Allied progression. And the worst winter in 50 years hit that part of Europe. Freezing rain, rain day after day after day, cold snow, until everything ground to a halt. Our trucks could not bring supplies to the troops that was in the front lines. Many of the troops, matter of fact, the majority of our troops did not have adequate winter gear. Many of them were still wearing the very gear that they wore when they stormed the beachhead in Normandy. They couldn't keep up with galoshes. They couldn't bring in the winter coats, the scarves, the gloves. Some had, but the majority of our troops didn't. And it was freezing cold. And with the rains and the snow, the clouds cut off all of our air superiority. Whereas up until that, we control the air over that part of Europe. The Luftwaffe. They didn't have any power left. But now because the fact that the weather had rolled in, our troops were beleaguered. They were hungry. They were cold. They couldn't get medical supplies. 
the wounded was suffering. Too many of our generals took the attitude that, well, the weather is bad, so that means nothing is going to happen. All of them were of that frame of mind with the exception of one American general. His name was George S. Patton. He told his staff, and they were telling him we can't get, he was over our tank corps. Our tanks can't move. The planes can't fly. We can't get supplies to our men. And one of his subordinates said, well, at least the Germans are in the same boat we are. And Patton turned around. He said, if I was Hitler, this is the weather that I would pick to mount a counteroffensive. When we have no eyes, the air, we can't see where the enemy is coming from. We can't bring food, supplies by air and drop. We're cut off. If that was me, if I was on the other side, this is the moment when I would marshal my forces and attack within two days. That very thing happened called the Battle of the Bulge. As Adolf Hitler had secretly in mad mass pulling troops from other areas of Europe and had massed a, a massive army along with artillery and tanks. And as the sun rose a couple of days later, he hit our lines with everything he had, creating a bulge in our lines. Americans here, Americans there, Germans pushing through. Thousands of American soldiers were captured. Hundreds were literally murdered. As Hitler had given the order, no prisoners. We don't have time to take care of prisoners. We don't have the food to feed them or the medical supplies to take care of them. And hundreds of Americans were rounded up in the fields and machine guns turned on them and they were mowed down. Day after day, it got worse and worse and worse. There was a little town in Belgium called Bastogne. On the surface, the city itself was insignificant, a little small town, but it had great military strategic importance because it had four roads that brought them all the way through Belgium and Holland, and it was Hitler's plan. I'm going to take Bastogne. I'm going to establish a fortress there. I have clear access to Rotterdam. The major, one of the major seaports that we control. And if I can take Rotterdam and break the Allies' stronghold on shipping items, I can maybe force the Allies to sue for peace. But to get to Rotterdam, you had to go through Bastogne. Bastogne was held by the 101st Airborne led by Lieutenant General Richard McAuffey. They were surrounded. They couldn't get supplies to them. Men were dying of their wounds. Men were dying of hypothermia. Some men were down to just the bullets they had in their rifles. No supplies. Starving. Freezing cold. The Germans begin to bomb with artillery Bastogne day after day after day. I was reading an account the other day of a survivor of that battle. And he said, it was the most horrible time of my life. He said, more men were killed, not from the explosion itself of the shells hitting the ground or hitting our foxholes, but there were so many trees in the vicinity that those shells would explode and shatter those trees. And we would find our men with their bodies riddled with parts of trees 
as it pierced their body. Loss of limb became paramount, arms, legs. But there was nothing they could do. The leader of the German army that was on the doorsteps of Bastogne sent an English-speaking German officer to bring an ultimatum to General McAuliffe, an ultimatum to surrender. He marched in, handed the letter to a subordinate who opened it up, and it said to the Allied commander of the armies of Bastogne, from the German general, the leaders of whatever their regiment was called, you are surrounded. There is no hope. Your casualty rate is exceeding your ability to handle it. Men are dying. You have no food. You have no bullets. You have no medical supplies. If you will surrender, we promise that we will feed you and that we will render the proper medical aid. To go on is fruitless. Do not participate in this slaughter. That's what he said. Anymore. That American officer read it and said, well, I have to take it to General McAuliffe. General McAuliffe was asleep. Woke him up and handed him the letter. McAuliffe read it. He goes, does he want an answer now? His subordinate said, yes. I love this. I love what I'm about to say. This is why, this is why I love being an American. McAuliffe looked at it and said, give me a piece, give me a pen. He wrote, to the German high commander, from the American commander, Lieutenant General Dick McAuliffe, you have asked for my surrender. Here's my answer. Nuts. His subordinate looked at it and said, nuts? He said, Just give it to him. Walked back down, that German officer in his leather trench coat, his plumed out pants, his black boots to his knees, his hat with the skull and crossbones in the middle, his iron cross at his neck, and handed it to him. He opened it up. Turned to his aide who spoke English and said, This is this. This is nuts. This is that mean. Not fat fat. Now you're going to have to. Are, 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 do we have any self righteous holy people in here this morning? Those that can't handle plain talk. He said, but, 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 what does this mean? And his aide who had gone to college in America and knew some idiom said, sir, he's just told you to go to hell. <laughs> he's not surrendering. He left. He said, we will show no mercy. We will roll over you with our tanks and our artillery. And McAuliffe had given the order, we will fight to the last bullet. There will be no surrender until there's no one left standing and nothing to fight with. Then and only then will we surrender. What he didn't know was at Patton's headquarters. Day after day, as Patton would get the weather report, socked in, no cloud. I mean, no break in the clouds. We can't see. Our planes don't know where to go. We can't drop supplies. And Patton, who was a very liberal cusser, a very 
profane man uttered a few choice epithets that I will not repeat. And he said, go get me the chaplain. Even heathens know that there's got to be a God in heaven. They can say they don't believe, but when their back is against the wall, the chaplain came up. He said, chaplain, do you have a prayer for clear weather? He stood there, no, I don't. He said, write one. He said, General, I don't understand. He said, we need these clouds to be rolled back. We need help from above. He told that chaplain, and I quote him, he said, Chaplain, I believe in God. And I believe in prayer. I believe that mortal men can call upon the divine one of heaven. And that God does involve, oh, I can feel that. God does involve himself in the affairs of men that will call upon him. Call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. Hallelujah. Chaplain said he went in, asked God to help him and wrote a prayer. Brought it back. Patton took it. And I don't remember the prayer verbatim because it was kind of long. But in essence he said, Heavenly Father. We come before you to seek divine providence over the weather that you have created. As God of the elements, we would ask that you would roll back the clouds. That you would give us clear weather so that we can get the needed supplies to our men. That we can... Push the spear further and banish the yoke of tyranny and Nazism on the shores of Europe. Grant us favor. Give us favor in battle. Anoint us to kill the enemy. Give us abilities that we don't possess within our own strength. Magnify our nucleus and our power and our might. And give us wisdom of how to attack and fight the enemy. And God, grant us victory. Grant us victory. Grant us victory. Grant us victory. Us victory. Hallelujah. And be with us until we eradicate the curse of Nazism once and for all. Patton read it. He said, that's what I'm talking about. He said, I want you to have this printed. 250,000 copies made. And I want a copy distributed to every single American soldier under my command. And I want you to tell them, I don't care what religion they are. I don't care if they're an agnostic or an atheist. I want them, when they receive this prayer, I want them to pray it. But not just pray it. I'm talking about faith. He said, I want them to believe it. Don't just say the words, but believe it. Believe there is a God in heaven. And believe these words. He didn't know, but he was talking Bible. For if any two shall agree on earth as touching any one thing, it shall be done of our heavenly Father. Somebody needs to shout. They distributed that prayer. And Patton's troops... I don't know if all of them prayed, but I do know it only takes two. But they begin to pray. And all of a sudden, the clouds begin to roll back. What's that old song, Pastor Bill? God will roll the clouds away. I'm so happy I now can say. 
God will roll the clouds away. Woo! Somebody needs to shout. Somebody needs to praise him. Somebody needs to lift their hands. God will roll your clouds away. I don't care what you're facing. God's looking for people that will say, God, you're in the cloud rolling away business. Hallelujah. And sun began to shine. Eisenhower called Patton. Can you get to Baston? How long will it take you to get there? It was well over a couple hundred miles away. He said, if you give me the fuel, I will break the blockade, and I'll get there in four days. Eisenhower said, there's no way you can do it in four days. He said, give me the fuel, and I'll do it. And then, oh, I love this. Patton called for a certain troop of men. Under his command, an all African American battalion, and said, You're the best drivers in Europe. If I give you the fuel, can you get to Bastogne and break the stronghold that the Germans have put around? And those precious African American troops looked at him and said, General, we can do it. We can do it. And they did it. Hallelujah. Woo! They did it. Hallelujah. Broke the Battle of the Bulge. Defeated the German army. And we pushed in to Berlin and, and the rest of Germany. And the rest is history. I'm trying to tell you something. You may be a heathen. But if you have an ounce of faith. If you have an ounce of faith. God will look down and grab a hold of that faith. And recognize it. And he will move heaven and earth to meet that. Somebody needs to praise him this morning. Faith. Faith, faith. My mother is a woman of faith. She is, she doesn't know the words, can't do it. That's not in her vocabulary. Matter of fact, when one time years ago, mother, dad, and I, we went to Dallas to the Cooper Clinic, which we were, you know, that was when my mom and dad were runners. I've been a runner off and on for nearly 40 years. I started before Nike. They got on my bandwagon. They owe me some free shoes. And Dr. Cooper was one of the foremost heart doctors and he was a runner he had a clinic and runners could go there and they would do a complete physical test your heart it was a very invasive intrusive it was very demanding never been through a physical like that in my life and then they would come up with a physical workup of what you needed to work on what you were strong and we, we get. but then part of it was a psychological exam. Take took about a month after you did it all before you got the results, and it was a boy, it was a big old report. And I remember we all got ours in. I didn't really care what mine said. I just wanted to know what does Mama's psychological report say. Serious. I'm not joking with you. And I got it. And I remember when I got to the part, this woman cannot be defeated. Her psychological profile was do not tell her she can't do something. She has an iron will. That's what it said. She has the makeup of 
only a small percentage of the American public. She doesn't see the problem. See, she's the solution. And I've said that for this reason. My mother, when she was a runner, she started coming down with side pains. They kept intensifying. And you got to understand something. Mother at times would be in so much pain, but she would drag herself out of bed in the morning, put her running clothes on, and go out and run. At sometimes in so much pain, she'd have to start bending over. She would not give in. Finally, my dad made her go to the doctor. The doctor said, and I don't want to go into all the details, but she said, you've got to have an operation. Don't you dare go run again. You can cause your body more problems. We're going to have to open you up and take care of it. And she just looked at the doctor and said, well, thank you. Now I need to find out what Jesus has to say. <laughs> the next morning, for daylight, Dad was getting dressed to go out to run. And he told Mother, now, Francis, stay in bed. Now, you got to understand something. Daddy will tell you, nobody tells Francis what to do. I mean, Daddy will start talking. She, Jimmy, shut up. Don't you tell me. Uh. He goes, Yes, dear. And my daughter, Jennifer, is just like her. I mean, iron mine. I mean, just will not give up. And I remember when she got, her and Cliff got married, I pulled him off the side and said, buddy, this is the best advice I can give you. Whatever Jennifer says, it's right. Amen. <laughs> just let her handle everything. And Daddy was getting ready to walk out the door. And he looked over and he saw Mother trying to get out of bed. And she was in pain. And he said, Francis, don't do this. You're hurting. Don't do this. And I remember when he told it in church. He said she could barely stand, but she looked up at me. She said, Jimmy, well people can run. And I am well in the name of Jesus. She said, you don't leave without me. I'm going with you. He just looked at her, just said, Francis, I'll do it. They walked out. She could barely walk, and they started. he started barely walking so she could keep up. And he said, all of a sudden, I started looking, and she was starting to rise up. Then all of a sudden, she began to jog. Then all of a sudden, she began to run. She said, Francis, what's wrong? She said, what's wrong? I'm healed. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is looking for people that will believe him. All right, that's my introduction. What is faith? The biblical, you know this, the biblical definition of faith is found in Hebrews 11.1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But what says, seemingly says a lot, many times really doesn't say much as far as our understanding. I like the definition from the Greek New Testament of Moulton and Milligan. They translated it this way. Faith is the title deed of things hoped for. In other words, faith claims this is mine. This is mine. This is mine. Now, you got to understand something when it comes to faith. Your faith must be anchored and directed toward that which is the will of God. If your faith is trying to go into a direction that is not the will of God for your life, faith will not work for you. So first and foremost, you've got to find the will of God for that situation that you're facing. Hello? Secondly, for it to be true faith, once you establish the will of God and you are in His will, the object of your faith must be correct. 
and the object of your faith in every situation is the cross of Jesus Christ. The Lord will not recognize faith pointed toward anything else other than the sacrificial atoning death of His Son on Calvary's cross. Your faith cannot be in your church. Your faith cannot be in your preacher. Your faith cannot be in your desire. Your faith has to be exclusively in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. True faith recognizes I can do nothing but true, true faith says, but through God, with God, all things are possible. That is the will of God. You know, there's some things that we don't have to ask the will of God. It, we don't have to ask the will of God for the Lord to save somebody. That's why he came. We don't have to ask the will of God if it's, if is it, is it your will for me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's his will. We don't have to assume, do I have to seek the will of God for my healing? No, I believe according to the word of God that healing is in the atonement. However, that needs explaining. Every one of us, we've been confounded with situations of people not being healed. And we didn't understand it. Well, first of all, let me explain that to you. First of all. Anyone that will tell you that they have a complete understanding of divine healing is lying to you. There's no person on planet earth that has a complete understanding on divine healing. Now, what do you mean by that? Because we only go by things that we can see. But the Lord operates not only the things that can be seen, but the things that we cannot see. What do you mean? The heart. I still don't understand. Well, I'm, I know people. They're in the physical condition they're in because they won't forgive people. Now, do you understand? When there is sin there, and unforgiveness is a sin. The Lord, the Lord gave it very clearly in, in the Sermon on the Mount. We are to forgive as we are forgiven. And if we don't forgive, we tie the hands of the Lord and we stop the flow of grace. So that could be a reason sometimes. Sometimes it may be that it's not God's time yet. You see, God's timing is just as important as God's will. When Joseph wound up in an Egyptian prison, if Joseph would have gotten out of prison when he wanted to, he would have been just another unemployed Jew walking the streets of Egypt. But when Joseph got out in God's time, He stepped out as the vice president of the country. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? God has a time. And sometimes that time is not on our schedule. But here's the main reason that we've got to understand about healing. God is sovereign. And everything he does, he does according to his sovereign wisdom and you cannot use the word of God against his sovereign wisdom and if God's wisdom is no it's right well everything God does is right not because he does it but because it is right do you understand what I'm saying and then last of all and I don't want to spend much time we only have All the benefits of salvation, partially. We don't have all of the benefits of salvation yet. The final benefit is a glorified body. And until that moment comes, we get old. 
I'm 67 years old. I don't look it, brother. If you would have shook in your head, yes, I would have prayed for your eyesight. I'm 67 years old. Now, in my brain, I'm 37. I don't think, I don't want to hang around most people that are 67. They're old. And I'm not going to get old. Hello? I mean, I mean, I, I see friends of mine. I went to Bible college. I was with one the other day. Debbie wasn't with me. She said, oh, how is so-and-so doing? I said, he's getting old. I said, he's walking like an old man. He's wearing Velcro tennis shoes. Don't you ever get Velcro tennis shoes. Even if you have to make somebody tie your laces. Don't give in. Don't give in. And, but the fact is, I may think in my mind I can do something. But my body says, no way, Jose. I used to run seven miles a day. I couldn't run seven miles today if you put a gun to my head. I used to be able to stay up all night without any sleep, get up, run seven miles, eat an extra large pizza, and never gain a pound. Now, if I smell a pizza, I gain 10 pounds. I can't run. I've got two titanium screws in my spine. I got three artificial cartilage discs where cartilage used to be. I can't really run much, so I walk a lot. And then, you know, and sometimes I get lazy. And I got lazy before Christmas, and I didn't do anything until Thursday here. Because I got up that morning, I was getting dressed early before daylight. And I said, oh, my God, I can't button my pants as freely as I used to. Get this fat behind me. And I ran into my closet, man, I, I'm having to run down, to get, I've got to get to the play. I'm grabbing my Nikes and my running stuff, and I'm throwing it in the bag. And, and they picked me up at the airport, Brother Barton did, drop me off to the hotel on Thursday. Man, as soon as I got in that room, I didn't unpack. I grabbed that suitcase, grabbed those tennis, grabbed, got those chrono clothes, and I, I went out. And I did five miles. And I did five miles yesterday. I didn't run this morning because it was sprinkling over at the hotel. But as soon as I get through here and get some, a little bit to eat, before we come back at 4 o'clock, I'm going to get my five miles in. I'm going to get my five miles in in the morning before I get on that airplane because I don't want to be fat. But I'm trying to make a point. You can do everything you want to do, but you can't. Defeat age. You can't defeat it. And as such, the body breaks down. And we become susceptible to sickness and disease. I don't need to spend more time on that. Hebrews 10.38 says, The just shall live by faith. Faith is... Is not a doctrine, it's a lifestyle. Do you understand? It is a lifestyle. You have to determine, I'm going to live my life in the realm of faith in God. Now, let's get to the text. Israel was delivered from the bondage of Egyptian powers. The deliverance of Egypt is a beautiful picture of the deliverance from the world. Egypt in Bible typology is a type of the world and the world system. Israel's deliverance from the stronghold and the, the yoke of Egyptian bondage was the greatest demonstration of God's power on earth that's ever been recorded. 
Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world of that day. Their armies had never tasted defeat. They were so advanced, according to other cultures, that the Egyptians of Moses' day was literally practicing some forms of brain surgery. That's a fact. The minds that built the pyramids, and when you stand before the pyramids like I have, and you look at them, and to try to comprehend in your mind, how did they build these massive things without technology? How did they do it? And it was all done by math. They were brilliant mathematicians. And they had the power. And here was God's people who were slaves. God raised up Moses and Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother, his spokesman. They went before Pharaoh and they uttered the greatest words, some of the greatest words that you'll ever read in the Word of God. Let my people go. What did Paul say? Paul said in Romans, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. It is not God's will for the world to have dominion over you in any single area of your life, but it's God's will through the power of the Holy Spirit and proper faith for you to walk in victory in every single area of your life. Spiritual, physical, financial, domestic, emotional. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Seven times Moses had to appear and say, let my people go. Now, that's important. Don't miss, miss that. That tells us Satan doesn't give up just because you pray a prayer. But Satan will push in. He'll say, I'm going to find out if you really believe what you say you believe. And then God began to send the plagues. This was, those plagues was the greatest demonstration of the power of God that's ever been seen on planet earth. I mean, you think about it. First, every body of water turned to blood. Why blood? Because the Egyptians in their religion, they worshiped the water and they believed that as they bathed in the waters of the Nile, that they received spiritual help from their deities. And God turned it to blood. The Bible said that lice covered the land. Oh, I love this one. Frogs! Now, you got to understand something. It literally meant that frogs were everywhere. That meant squish, 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 squish. That meant you woke up to a choir. Ribbit, ribbit. Frogs everywhere. Frogs in the bed. Frogs in the bathroom. Frogs on the floor. Frogs in your clothes. Frogs everywhere. Now this, let me get to this. Shows you how dumb the world is. Pharaoh. The palace is covered in frogs. He couldn't sit on the throne until they got rid of all the frogs. He's sitting on the throne and there's frogs jumping all around his feet. He sends for Moses and Aaron. He says, get rid of the frogs. Moses said, okay. Moses then says, When do you want the frogs gone? And this shows you how dumb the world is. Tomorrow. In essence, what he was saying was, I want one more night with the frogs. Each one a demonstration. Each plague a demonstration of the power of God. And yet, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Faith is not easy. Faith is hard. 
They got through those plagues. And I want you to notice this. When the last plague before the death of the firstborn, when that last, next to last plague came, the nation of Egypt was destroyed. Its crops, gone. Livestock, dead. But I want you to remember this. Not one single Israelite was delivered because of those plagues. Only until the blood of the Lamb was applied to the doorpost. Only through the blood did deliverance come. Oh, hallelujah. They go out. You know the story. All of a sudden, Pharaoh comes to him and says, why did I let them go? Satan doesn't give up. And he sends his army and his chariots after them. Satan will always pursue the child of God. He will always be napping at your heels. He's always snapping and barking. He won't. He does not want to let you go. But he does not have the final say so. Then the Bible said they came to the Red Sea. That was an obstacle. There is always obstacles in this walk of faith. Satan will put obstacle after obstacle that stand between you and the victory that God has for you. The key is you can't let the obstacle stop you. God is greater than the obstacle. And then the Bible said the Lord began to speak. Faith always speaks. Faith has a language all of its own. Faith says, I can't, but God can. Faith says the word of God is greater and sharper than any two-edged sword. Faith says that God is a savior. The Lord is a healer. He's a deliverer. He's a baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He's greater than the mountains in front of me. He's greater than the mountains before me. He's greater than the valley that I'm in. Faith says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Oh, I got to. Faith said... Fear not. Fear not. Oh, somebody needs to get a hold of that. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and a love and a sound mind. I'm not scared of some pandemic. I'm not scared. I'm not worried about a mask or getting this shot or that shot. I, come on. Come on. Come on. I'm sick and tired of Christians. I can't go to church. I might die. Come on, give me a break, folks. The Lord spoke and said, stand still. Stand still. What stand still means is don't trust in your own strength. But like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. We stand on the authority of the word of Almighty God. Ooh. Said, fear not, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. The battle is His, not ours. Quit fighting battles that were won at Calvary 2,000 years ago. Oh, I'm getting hungry. He will show you today. He will show you today. God is a now God. God is a now God. God says victory today. Victory today. Victory today. Victory today. He will show you today. Then he said, For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more. Forever. What does that mean? That means God's victory is a complete victory once and for all. 
See, Alcoholics Anonymous says, you got to stand up and say, I'm an alcoholic. But the Word of God says, if you are a new creation, you stand up and say, I'm no longer an alcoholic. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I don't have to carry a little chip in my pocket because God has delivered me. The Lord shall fight for you. So why are you trying to fight the Lord's battle? What, what do you mean? Christians are always trying to do something. I can fast it away. If I read enough scripture, I can get rid of it. If you notice, there's one common denominator in all those things. It's the word I. I can do this. No, you can't. No, you cannot win the victory. Only Christ. The Lord could fight for Israel. Let me read it as I wrote it down. The Lord could fight for Israel only as they stood still and rested in him. Now, the Lord speaks to Moses and says, tell my people, go forward. Go forward. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to death. Victory is on the other side of Jordan. Oh, but it's at flood tide. Just keep going forward. And the moment they got close to the waters, the hand of God miraculously came down and opened the river, the Red Sea, and they marched across on dry ground. Hallelujah. I, this is what I got to close with. No matter the problem, no matter the obstacle that you're facing, Go forward, go forward, go forward. Keep pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Stand to your feet this morning. Lift your hands and start worshiping him right now. Just lift, let me hear your voices as you call out to him. Do you know that old song? Maybe you don't, it's so old. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? You know that one? Get that mic up here. As he begins to sing this old song, Got any rivers? Thought impossible. Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes. In things thought impossible. And he'll do for you what no other man can do. Come on up here, Pastor Bill. As he begins to sing it, if you're facing a Red Sea, I want you to step out and come down. Come on right now. If there's a problem, if there's an obstacle, if there's a battle you're facing, come on down and stand here. Let us pray with you this morning. Come on. This is your moment. Any mountain. Specializes in things thought impossible. He'll do for you. He'll do for you. What no other. What no other power. If you got do. children that are unsaved, you need to get down here. If you got loved God. ones you've been praying for, you need to get Any down here. River. Got any 
God, any mountains you can't tumble through. God specializes. God specializes in things thought impossible. He'll do for you what no other power can do. Just begin to play it softly. Lift your hands right now. Every one of you that's down here, lift your hands. And this is our prayer this morning. It's a prayer of praise. It's going to be a prayer of praise. It's faith. Where there's faith, there is praise. Where there is praise, there is faith. Now lift those hands. Those of you in the audience, stretch your hands toward them. And lift your voices. And lift your voices to the Lord and begin to worship Him. And those of you down here, I want you to begin to claim your victory this morning. Whether it's spiritual, physical, financial, domestic, emotional, whatever it may be. Those of you joining us by the live stream, wherever you are, lift your hands and begin to believe the Lord right now. Come on, right now. Let me hear your voices. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Lord, touch my sister right now. Will In the name of Jesus. Not be, hallelujah. I shall not be moved. I shall not be. Shall not be, shall not be moved. Just like the tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. Will I shall not be, I shall not be moved, I shall not be, I shall not be moved, just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved, though the tempest rages, I shall not be moved. Upon the rock of ages, I shall not be moved, just like the tree planted by the wall. Father, in the name of Jesus, give this young man victory, whatever the battle is. 